you did a beautiful spoken word piece in which you you kind of tied in your artistic side and your uh, very artificial intelligent machine learning coding side. It was about facial classification software that wasn't able to properly classify First Lady Michelle Obama mm -hmm. as a woman. Michelle Obama, unabashed and unafraid to wear her crown of history, yet her crown seems a mystery to systems unsure of her hair. A wig, a buffon, a toupee, maybe not. Are there no words for our braids and our locks? Tell me a little bit about what that poem, that spoken word piece, means to you and why you came to write it. Absolutely. So I wrote AI Ain't I a Woman as a reflection on research I did at MIT. And this research looked at how accurate are facial analysis technology systems when it comes to guessing the gender of a face. Now, why was I doing this in the first place? Well, I had this experience of working on art projects that use facial analysis technology, and I had to wear a white mask to even have my face detected. You had to wear a white Literally mask. Literally go in, you know, they talk about blackface. You this was white, white face. face. Yes, I had a white face to be detected. And I thought, okay, this Wait a minute. is weird. Wait a minute, what is going through your mind? So at the point I was really frustrated, I was working on this project and I thought I had the facial recognition code right or the face detection code, but it wouldn't get my face. So the first thing I actually did was I drew a, a face on my hand and it detected the face on my hand. So I was like, wait, now if it can detect the face on my hand, what else do I have in my office? So I had a white mask in my office because it was close to Halloween and we had a party. And so I put I put the white mask and I was just, I was first surprised. I was like, there's no way, right? Okay, the hand, but the white mask. So literally I was just, I was bemused. And then I was like, wow, Fanon already said it, black skin, white mask. I just started thinking of all of these other references of what it means to change yourself to fit a system or society that wasn't designed for you. And this is something I call the exclusion overhead. How much do you have to change yourself, right, to fit in? You, you talk a lot about transparency when it comes to the AI community at large. What is transparency like in the community and what are you hoping to see more of? So there needs to be transparency during the design, development, and deployment of AI systems. So when we're thinking about design, we have to think about who's designing in the first place. If you look at the tech industry, it's not very diverse. In most large tech companies, less than the 20% of the technical workers are women. And if you look at people of color, you're closer to more of the 2% range, right? So if who's designing these systems isn't that diverse, we can run into some issues. Then there's also the actual development process. How are these systems being built? What data is being used to train this? And sometimes we don't know. So when I was working on my art project and I used code that wasn't detecting my face, I didn't know how that code was trained. Like many other computer scientists, we kind of use off-the-shelf parts, code libraries, right. right? But if we don't have transparency in how the system was trained or what the limitations are, you're going to use it hoping or assuming it works well for everybody, but that might not be the case. And it's not just that, oh, this developer was trying to make a system that wouldn't detect your face. Right. Oftentimes it's not intentional, but if you're not intentional about being inclusive, what you will do is perpetuate exclusion. You mentioned a lot the coded gaze mm. in your work. Can you tell me what the coded gaze is and how it affects artificial intelligence? Sure, so some people might be familiar with terms like the male gaze or the white gaze, which is essentially saying the identity you have, your position in the world influences what you perceive and how you perceive it, including what's important. So when I talk about the coded gaze, I'm talking really about power. Who has the power to shape the priorities that we put in place when we're creating AI and who shapes the preferences? And the coded gaze also reflects our prejudices, our, our limitations as well. It's a very useful term. If the coded gaze is predominantly white, predominantly male, what is causing this? What is the, what is the cause of this very, very uh, restricted gaze? Is it the data sets that we're feeding into the algorithms? Is it the people that are uh, translating or, or making sense of the data? Or is it the software itself? Who is being malicious here? 
Well, the interesting thing is no one has to be intentionally malicious for the coded gaze to manifest. And so the coded gaze is a reflection of who holds power. And when we think about tech, I like to use this example of power shadows. So we're talking earlier about facial recognition. It can be biased and so forth. So my question was, well, we have all these, you know, smart people working on this tech. How did we get to this point? And so I started doing the research and I looked at some of the key data sets that were being used by other researchers and even a key data set that came from the National Institute for Standards and Technology. This is supposed to be the gold standard data set. Mm -hmm. So I looked at that gold standard data set and then I found out it was 75% male and 80% lighter skin. And if you looked for women of color, less than 5%. The way they collected it is they thought, let's collect public figures. So now if you look at who holds power in the world and you're saying, let's do a convenience data collection and you're doing public figures, you're going to reflect the patriarchy. So if you look at the representation of parliament members around the world, it's around 77%. So that you get this power shadow of 75% in the data set is not so surprising. Another power shadow we're seeing is a reflection of white supremacy. Again, let's look at how we gather these data sets. Oftentimes for large scale data sets, you're going to try to scrape what's readily available, right? You go online, so then we have to say who's representing presented in the media and who's not, right? So this is what I mean by these power shadows. It's literally reflecting structural inequality. So in some ways you can say society is to blame, but you can also say specifically those people who were developing the data sets not being explicit in checking to make sure what they were creating was actually representative of the world was a problem. Who should be responsible of making sure that that is reflected, you and I, as people of color, as women, that we should be reflected more accurately in the technology that's designed for us to use as end users at the end of the day. Well, it's an interesting conversation about the governance of AI, because even if you make these tech systems more inclusive, it can be used for surveillance. So now you have a situation where I have highly accurate facial recognition. Now let's put that highly accurate facial recognition on a drone with a camera and a gun. So now this conversation is more than, was I included in the data set? Maybe you don't want to be in that particular That's so interesting. I never thought of it in that way. The more that the artificial intelligence and, and data can recognize you, yeah. you are now involved. You are. And so I call this a cost of inclusion, but they're also cost of exclusion. There is a recent study that came out from researchers at Georgia Institute of Technology, and they were looking at pedestrian tracking systems, trying to see if I can see a person on the street, because if you have a self-driving car, you don't want people to get hit. Basic yeah, object Just for the detection. crime of being maybe a woman yeah. or non-white. Well, so this is what they found out. They tested these systems and found they were less accurate for people with darker skin as compared to lighter skin. So now this is a cost of exclusion. So you have cost of inclusion, I end up in mass surveillance, cost of exclusion, maybe I get hit. How do we eradicate these anomalies and these exclusion and inclusion uh, costs when it comes to artificial intelligence? Absolutely, I think the first thing we have to keep in mind is people need to have a choice in whether or not AI is being used. Affirmative consent is not a current pattern in the way we develop these systems. If I log into a particular service, they're gonna harvest my data, and this is what it takes to be part of the connected digital world. But that's actually a design choice. It doesn't have to be the case that just by entering a place, I can automatically take your face information. So I think that's the first thing, making sure people actually have a choice. The other thing is meaningful transparency. If I'm going to a job interview that's using facial analysis technology to infer my emotional engagement or my problem solving abilities, and there's a company hire view that claims to be able to do this. Wow. I need to know. So if you don't have meaningful transparency, you can have no due process. If something goes wrong, how can you contest, right? So affirmative consent, meaningful transparency, and then also continuous oversight. 
in the UK, they started piloting facial recognition technology, but made the requirement that the police had to report the performance metrics. When they reported the performance metrics. Oh goodness. 90%, over 90% false positive match rates. This was t May 2018. More than 2,400 innocent people being mismatched with criminal suspects. So even if these technologies went through certain checks or you're saying, yes, the police is using this tech, right? There's transparency there. You still have to check how it's impacting society. It's something continuous. It's that motivation for you to continue to do what you do. I want to understand your drive and your passion because it's palpable in every word you say. Like, where do you get this drive? Well, for me, it's understanding that it's not just about facial analysis technology. AI is, depend is trying to decide if you get a job, right? AI is deciding if you have access to medical treatments. And if we get that wrong, it's more than just saying, oh, your Afro looks like a toupee. You have real world consequences. And that's what drives me, knowing that so many of the advances people before me have fought for in terms of equality, right? If we're looking at job equality, all of that can be erased because we introduce AI that's biased and we're not checking. And so then it seems like, oh, well, these decisions are objective because they came from a machine. And while we would like to believe that, because we're using machine learning that's learning from data that we have created that reflects structural inequalities, it's not going to always be fair if we're not intentional. So that's what drives me, because real lives are at stake. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.